Thank you, Alan, for this very kind invitation. Um, usually I have an, an extremely captive audience in these lecture theatres, but uh, so I really appreciate your, your genuine interest because I know that you, you don't have to be here. I'm also well aware that we're, in the, we're probably all in the sort of post-absorptive state after lunch and it's very hot in this room, so you know, we're really going to have to keep with it to, to stay awake. So on that basis then, I would really encourage you as we go through this lecture, I have a loose agenda, but I'm also happy to address your comments or questions as we go along rather than wait until the end. So if there's something that I put up that makes no sense to you, please put your hand up and we'll, uh, we'll discuss it if you wish. Okay, so as Alan said, you know, the, the area that, that my group, my research group works on um, really deals with cell biology and molecular genetics of development. So we're interested in how heart cells form during embryogenesis when, when a baby forms uh, in particular. But today I, I, I chose this tack of talking about stem cells because some of the work that we do touches on stem cell biology and I know that it's, it's constantly in the, in the popular literature these days and, and people like to know about it. I think, uh, where is it there, the Aristotle comment, all people by nature desire knowledge. So on this basis then I thought we would talk about stem cells today and, and our little pitch in terms of, of, of what we know about it from the work that we do. So let's uh, move forward here. Actually, before I, oh no, I realized that I wanted to take my jacket off, but I have this uh, device in my pocket that would, uh, <laughs> would be problematic, so. Um, so here's the title of the talk. Um, Let's move on from there. So whenever I say to the students who take my fourth year development class, we're going to have to start right at the beginning on this topic. They all groan, oh, this is going to be a really long one. So I'm sorry to say we do have to start at the beginning uh, in this lecture to, to understand a little bit about stem cell biology. So here goes then. So when fertilization takes place, the, the egg is released from the ovaries and grabbed by these fimbriae and starts making its way into the oviduct. And fertilization takes place somewhere in this initial phase of the oviduct. And then as the fertilized egg moves along, it divides, so the cells divide, two cell, four cell, eight cell, and eventually it becomes this structure that we call a, call a morula just before it implants into the uterine wall where it's termed a blastocyst. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you all, a, uh, a, a give you all a test on all of these names at the end, so make sure that you remember. Um, so here's the blastocyst then, it's still just a, a, a few cells at this point, encapsulated by this little membrane called the zona pellucida, which is very important for ectopic pregnancies and so on, but we're not going to talk about that right now. So the question is then, how do you get from that fertilized egg to, to this? <laughs> now that is a big question. You know, Janusz Kaczynski asked the question this morning, what are the frontiers of science? And he was talking about this expansive view of space and going to Mars and so on. But, you know, to me, I mean, one of the most fascinating questions that I've ever contemplated is how do you go from having a fertilized egg to this amazing thinking, moving machine? This one's called Jack and this one's called Sam. Um, so it, it, this, this question really does occupy my thought a lot. And, and so what I'd like to do is, is, uh, is give you a glimpse into those questions and, and, and ideas that we have related to this. So if we look through a microscope then at uh, the early stages of development, what we see is this. Um, so here's the uh, two cell, four cell, eight, eight cell stage 
And then this, this event that we call compaction, where the cells kind of compact together. You can see that you, no, you can no longer see the cell membranes here in this, uh, in this morula. Eventually, we get to the point, as I mentioned to you before, of forming a blastocyst. And this blastocyst um, is named as such because it has this cavity in it that we call a blastocele cavity. And when that cavity forms, the cells in this region um, form one of two types. Either they're called trophoectoderm, which is the, the, the cells that, that give rise to all of the non-embryonic structures like the placenta and the amniotic sac and so on. And then there are these incredibly special cells that are just here nudged against the blastocele cavity that are called embryonic stem cells. So these cells, and there are only a few of them here in these initial stages, give rise to all of the tissues of the animal. Incredible. A few cells, they're going to expand in numbers, and then they're going to start to specialize into different cell types. So we, we can all, I think, intuitively understand that the cells in our heart that beat to allow our, our, our heart to beat and pump blood around the body are very different in character to a neuron. They have a different, what we call a phenotype. They look dramatically different. And if you took a cell from your liver, it would look very different to a skeletal muscle that we use to run and jump around. So how on earth do you start off with this cell that is essentially um, what we call pluripotent, and you pluripotent meaning it can become anything. And, and then over a period of time, those cells make decisions to become different cell types. How, how do we orchestrate that? And it, it's quite a fascinating question. So we've run into the first definition. We already know where embryonic stem cells are. Wait, well, that was easy, wasn't it? And we, we also know that these cells are pluripotent, which is another key marker of stem cell biology, meaning that they can become anything, any tissue of the body. Um, the other major property that these stem cells have is they have this property called, called self-renewal. Self-renewal refers to the fact that when you get a stem cell dividing into two cells, one can self-renew, meaning it can become another stem cell, and the other daughter cell can then go on and differentiate into a cell type like a cardiac cell or a skeletal muscle cell. So those are the two main properties of stem cells. Okay, let's move on a little bit. So here's another picture. It really doesn't tell you anything that I haven't already shown you before, but we have some nice uh, um, ways of visualizing these cells um, using antibodies that are shown here. So this is the inner cell mass again. So as I've said to you, um, the question then is, if we have these, these cell types in the body that are very different, how do we orchestrate that? So here I'm just showing you a picture of some cardiac myocytes. These are, these are heart muscle cells. They're expressing a protein here that is specific to, to muscle cells of the heart that allows them to contract. So we know they're heart cells versus these cells, which are neurons in the central nervous system. So they're very different. So how do we orchestrate that? Well, now it starts to get really bad for us all because we have to delve into the field of genetics and genomes um, and talk about genes for a few minutes. So I'm sure that you all know this, this, this scheme of events that we call the central dogma in molecular biology. And it goes like this. In the nucleus, so this is our typical cell here, in the nucleus, all of the DNA, pretty much all of the cellular DNA is encompassed in the nucleus. And that is an information coding center, if you like. And in fact, in a human cell, in a single cell in your body, which is about 10 microns in diameter, um, 
there's three billion base pairs of DNA in each nucleus. Now, if there are any engineers here who would like to figure out how to fit three billion of anything into something that's about you know, two or three microns in diameter, then you know, nature has come up with a quite astounding uh, solution to this problem. So three billion base pairs of DNA in our, uh, in our genome, in every cell in the body, nearly every cell. And uh, when certain genes within that DNA need to be turned on, what happens is this central dogma where part of the DNA is copied into a molecule that we call, that we call RNA. And that RNA is translated into these structures called proteins. Now, proteins are really the, the machinery of the cell. Everything that you do and the, everything that the cell does and the way that the cell looks is primarily due to the expression of these proteins within the cell. So these are the functional entities that allow all, all uh, uh, cellular processes. So the issue then for having a cell look and perform differently is in the capability to select the number of genes that you express in any given progenitor cell or stem cell. So we have in the human genome about 20,000 genes, give or take a few. Um, but most cells of the body don't express every single one of those 20,000 genes. They express different programs of genes. And that's what allows us for a, a muscle cell to look like a muscle cell and function as a muscle cell, a neuron to look like a neuron and function as a neuronal cell. So it's a selective expression of the genome. So how do we, how do we orchestrate that? How does the cell actually decide, I'm going to turn on 3,000 genes that allow me to become a cardiac myocyte, for example. So this has really been the holy grail of cell and developmental biology for many, many years. So here's, here's the issue. Um, we have the DNA in our nucleus. It's an information coding center, if you like. It's kind of static. And it's a relatively simple structure, even though, of course, Watson and Crick didn't think so, you know, all those years ago when they solved the structure. But it is compared to the proteins, because the proteins, the genes that end up encoding for these protein molecules, are extremely complex, as you might well understand, because these things have to do all of the cellular activities, everything from maintaining pH balance, to, to replicating DNA, to uh, extruding molecules in and out of the cell. So these are incredibly complex molecules. So this is the, uh, the so-called post-genomic era that we're in now, where we're studying the proteins that are encoded by the genome. So this is the genome, and the, in any given cell, the proteins that are expressed in that cell that we now call the proteome. In our field, everything ends in ohm these days. <laughs> so I'm sure there'll be another ohm soon. Um, but anyway, th this is a, a much more complex question than, than what was an, a, a pretty amazing feat of actually sequencing the genome all those years ago now. You know, th this was a, a, a trivial question compared to the one of understanding all of the proteins in the cell. So a lot of what we do now is, is, is aimed at understanding the, the, these protein molecules and how they function. So we're, uh, we're getting even deeper down now. So I want to talk to you about the actual structure of an individual gene. Um, so if we think of this little schematic here as a as a double-stranded piece of DNA, the information coding region that I just told you about, um, it has regions in it that we call exons that encode, when it's, when it's transcribed, encode those protein molecules that I told you about. But this is the boring bit. 
because the protein coding region in most genes is incredibly conserved across animal species. And in fact, if you look at the genome of a mouse, it would be 99% identical to ours in, in the coding region of genes. So clearly, you know, the difference between me and a mouse cannot be explained by the fact that 99% of the coding region of all my genes is identical. It's got to be something else. And the something else primarily is this, that if you have a region of DNA that's transcribed, that ends up in a protein molecule, the key elements are the control elements that decide whether that gene is transcribed or not. So these are not, these don't encode anything that ends up in the, the eventual protein. These are control elements in the genome that decide a few important things. When and where and how much this gene is transcribed. And that is very important. So what's the molecular machinery that allows you to do that, to select which genes that you actually turn on? Well, it turns out that um, if we use this simple cartoon again, there are protein molecules that we call transcription factors, and they bind to those regulatory regions in DNA, and they determine, and this is a very complex sort of multi-protein structure, they determine whether that gene is transcribed or not. And in some cases, they actually they can function as repressors as well, meaning that they silence the, the genome in that region. So we're dealing with these molecules that, oops, that bind to DNA, and we call them transcription factors, shown here. So what do they really look like? Here's a real structure, a ribbon structure of a, of a, a protein DNA interaction. Um, so you can see the protein here, it almost has this scissors-like structure where it attaches to the DNA molecule, which is down the bottom here, in this case in the major groove, and it clamps onto the DNA. And this molecule, catalytically, is able to, to contribute to the control of the genes that it binds to. So these transcription factors, needless to say, 35 years or so ago when I started working in this business were the holy grail of understanding gene expression. <clears throat> of course, the, the, the problem gets even worse for us by the fact that I just shown you that, that linear DNA structure, but actually DNA in the cell is packaged in a very different way because it's packaged um, around these structures that are called uh, histones. So these are proteins and they function a bit like a disc and around each disc there are two wraps of DNA. And this is the, the, the way that nature has evolved to package all of that DNA into the nucleus in these what we call a nucleosome structure. The nucleosome structure is the DNA wraps around these protein molecules called histones. So there's an additional complexity here that we have to deal with, which is that the DNA, when it's compacted into the chromosomes, is not easily accessible to those transcription factors that I told you about. And this leads us into this field of, um, of epigenetics. And again, this is a common term that you might have heard of because epi epigenetics refers to the fact, I think epi is Greek maybe for outside. It's, 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 um, it's regulation from outside of the genome, epigenetics. And so what does it mean? Well, here is a typical uh, DNA structure where, as I say, we have the nucleosomes wrapped around these, uh, these histone cores, and that's all packaged into these solenoid structures, and, and each, each chromosome will have many, many thousands of these. And so 
There are two states that these nucleosomes can be in. They can be in an open state where they're ex the genes are accessible, or they can be in a condensed state where they're not accessible. And, and so there's a whole machinery that's involved with um, determining whether these are in a condensed state where they're not, where the DNA is not accessible, or in an open state where it is. And I don't want to go into this in any great detail in this lecture, but the whole field of epigenetics is really um, dedicated towards understanding you know, these open and closed states. Because these, these little um, marks, if you like, these methyl groups that are added, or in some cases taken away, or these acetyl groups, are really the, the epigenetic marks that determine genome accessibility. So that's the field of epigenetics. We're, we're not going to worry about it too, too much further. Okay, so here are our favorite transcription factors again, binding to DNA and activating transcription. Uh, I want to tell you about one particular molecule that I've worked on for the last 20 something years. It's called MEF2, it stands for Myocyte Enhancer Factor 2 myocyte being in muscle cells. And um, molecular biologists love acronyms. We have hundreds of them. And I'm trying not to use many in this talk, but um, if, I, if I do use too many, please uh, put up your hand. So MEF2 is, is a, a very important molecule in, in, in development. The reason being, when I was a postdoc in Boston in the early 90s, we were looking for um, a protein that binds to the regulatory regions that activate cardiac genes. And we knew that there was this AT-rich sequence, which is a genome sequence, that is important in the activation of many cardiac genes. So we wanted to know what the factor was that binds to it. And to cut a long story short, actually about three years of work, um, <laughs> it was this molecule, MEF2. So it binds to those regulatory regions in cardiac cells and it activates literally hundreds of thousands of um, copies of cardiac specific genes. And that leads to uh, a progenitor cell or a stem cell being committed to the cardiac lineage, meaning becomes a cardiac cell. So this was really the holy grail. You need this molecule during your development in your heart in order to turn on the genes that are required for the formation of a cardiac muscle cell. Is there any way to turn it on? Um, there are, there are. There are pharmacological ways to, um, to activate the gene expression program that leads to the production of that. There are also ways of turning it off, which is um, pharmacologically, there's actually a very common um, uh, drug, uh, beta blockers, which are used in the heart. Actually, nearly everyone with heart disease um, uh, has, uh, has been treated with beta blockers. Maybe, that will come a little bit later. That will come a little bit later. I'll address your question in a few minutes. So it is possible to pharmacologically manipulate these pathways that lead to the expression of these genes, no question. But it's also a very complex uh, question as well. Um, so let me show you this, which I, I love, the, this, this little transgenic mouse. So this is a mouse in which we've, uh, we've inserted a, a foreign gene. And this foreign gene, is a, is a sensor, it tells us about when that protein, MEF2, is active. And so when you see blue here, obviously I'm, I don't want to go into the technology too much with you right here, but when you see blue, that's an indication uh, that that protein, MEF2, is active. So where is it active in this little embryo? This guy is actually about three millimeters across, so it's not as big as it is there. They're quite tiny, you know, you have to sit on a microscope to, uh, to deal with them. Um, so this is a mouse embryo about day nine, day nine post-conception. 
And the, the usual gestation in a, one of our little mice friends is about 21 days. So at nine days, the embryo looks like this. And where is MEF2, this, this protein that we know is involved in the activation of cardiac genes? It's in this amazing little structure here called the cardiac crescent. This is how your heart starts off. These are the progenitor cells that are going to give rise to your four-chambered heart eventually. But it's got to go through a lot of changes, as you can see. So it forms initially a linear tube, then it goes through these very complex rearrangements to form a four-chambered heart. And we're working on how all that works quite avidly. But anyway, for now, I'll, I'll just have to uh, hope that uh, I can convince you that this is, is the, the early stages in the formation of cells that are committed to becoming heart. Now you might say, well, yes, I see that, but I also see there's lots of blue in these other structures. What on earth are they? Well, it turns out that these are called somites. Remember this, because this will be in the test at the end. <laughs> um, these are somites, and, and these, are, these are blocks of tissue that align the neural tube, which is going to become your, uh, your, your uh, central nervous system. So they're blocks of tissue on either side of the neural tube that give rise to skeletal muscle. So it turns out that, that MEF2 is actually, we didn't know it at the time when we first cloned it, but it turns out to be important in both the formation of cardiac and skeletal muscle. Well, there are some commonalities in the two tissues. They're not, they're not identical by any means, but the, in, the, in the early stages, they are. And so what we found with the, with the identification of this molecule is something that contributes to the early activation of the cells that become all of your skeletal musculature. So all of the, the, your uh, running muscle, all the voluntary muscle, as well as the heart muscle. So it's a pretty important molecule. And in fact, if you knock this gene out, and there are ways that, that we can use to knock the gene out, uh, and then see what happens developmentally, in a mouse model, if you knock out MEF2, it's embryonic lethal. So that kind of gives you an example that, or, or an indication of the importance of it, that embryogenesis fails if you don't have that molecule in place at the right time. Okay, so, um, so I've told you about one molecule that in an embryo is very important for sending those stem cells, remember the, right at the beginning there, sending those stem cells down a cardiac fate. Now I want to just give you a, um, an indication now of, of another type of stem cells Stem cells are not restricted to embryos. There are stem cells in adults as well, fortunately for us, in many systems, more systems than we originally anticipated. Um, so stems, adult stem cells reside in tissues in your body, and the ones that I'm going to tell you about now are cells that, um, that sit in your skeletal muscle. And originally, they were called satellite cells by this guy who, who saw them under a microscope in the 1960s, Mauro. He didn't really know what they were, but he called them satellite cells because they didn't look like the other cells in the muscle, which looked like this. So if you take a, you know, a, a, a typical one of you guys in the audience here who looks like this in terms of your musculature, um, and, and you look at one of these... Uh, one of these muscles, is the, the tendons here, is the belly of the muscle. If you take a transverse section through that, so you chop through it here, you'll see that there are lots of these, these cylindrical cells that, that are muscle fibers. Now these fibers are, have this incredibly complex pattern of gene expression, so they express all these genes that are involved in contraction, allow us to move, also they, they can respond to nervous input, because obviously we need control of our muscles. Um, so, so they're very specialized cells. And also they're very unusual because they don't fit the, uh, the normal bill for being a typical 
uh, cell that you see in a cartoon. They're very long, for one thing. Sometimes, you know, you can have muscle cells in your leg that are, that are this, this long, you know. So, and also, they're multinucleated. What does that mean, multinucleated? So it means lots of nuclei. So that it's not a single nuclei in that cell. There are hundreds of them controlling that cell. So this is a hallmark of your skeletal muscle. But what's interesting is that the cells that, uh, that Mauro found were cells that sit on these fibers, and, but they're outside of the plasma membrane. So they're sitting there on top, and they're kind of quiescent, which means they're just kind of sitting there doing nothing until you injure your muscle, which I have many times being a soccer player, an ex-soccer player. Um, <laughs> So when, when you get kicked in your gastrocnemius or you know, one of your other muscles, you, you may notice that um, it's really sore for a few days, but your muscle is incredibly regenerative. In about five days, your muscle, if you took histochemistry of it, looks pretty much repaired. And the reason why it's repaired is because of these satellite cells, which when you damage the muscle, become activated. They proliferate, which means that they divide, and then they differentiate, which means that they express all of these genes, and they contribute to the repair of the muscle. So in this case, then, these, um, these are adult stem cells. They're, they're, they have all the, uh, the, the capacity of, of typical stem cells, but they're sitting there resident in the skeletal muscle. When you need them, then they, uh, they're activated and they repair the muscle. Um, and these have tremendous regenerative potential. Um, so the idea is that if we can harness those kinds of cells, um, that maybe we'll be able to uh, repair muscle in disease states such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And another area that's very big at the moment is, is this area of muscle wasting. As we age, we tend to lose muscle mass. And that, and that can be quite debilitating in an elderly population. So uh, one of the, uh, the, the areas in the, the regenerative medicine area in skeletal muscle is how to maintain that skeletal muscle pool from these stem cells. Um, there are other applications of these too. There are some diseases like cancer where a secondary effect of the cancer is a condition that we call cancer cachexia, which is a, 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 a loss of muscle mass, which, which is extremely debilitating, so much so that people can't uh, sustain chemotherapy and so on because they're so weak. So, so again, you know, this knowledge of, of, of satellite cell biology may have some implications for that. So here's our little contribution lately, which I was absolutely thrilled about. So I might need to knock the lights down for you a little bit here, so I'll, I'll try and do that. Mind you, you might go to sleep. Um, for those of you who are not asleep already, of course. Um, so. So here's our contribution. One of my students has been working with this molecule. It's not MEF2. It's called FRA2. Still a 2. I don't know why, but anyway, there you go. But we had found this, this, uh, this factor to be expressed in muscle cells in culture. Um, but we made a real breakthrough with this group in the UK at the University of Reading when we, we detected the expression of this molecule, FRA2, um, in the muscle fibers, but, as you can probably guess from the location here, in the satellite cells. So FRA2 is actually expressed not in the, the muscle fiber itself, which I showed you there, and it's expressed in the satellite cells. So this gives us a, a fantastic marker to be able to retrieve those cells and maybe use them uh, for regenerative medicine. So we're only in the early stages of this, but we, we literally just got a, a CIHR, which is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, 
we got a five-year grant to study this in the most recent competition. So, um, so hopefully in a few years' time when I come back and you'll all be here, um, I'll be able to tell you what, uh, what FRA2 does in terms of, of, of the regeneration of skeletal muscle. Okay, so here's the idea then. Um, satellite cells sit outside the plasma membrane of these muscle fibers. When it's damaged, they replicate. They go through this asymmetric division. Well, that's a big word. Asymmetric meaning one cell, as we said before, um, differentiates into a muscle cell, and the other one self-renews as a new satellite cell. So fulfilling that, that role as a, as a stem cell. So if we capture those cells, what do they do? Well, here they are. Um, in, in culture now, in a dish, in the lab, under special conditions, they will proliferate when we culture them under certain conditions. If we change the conditions, we can now get them to form these muscle fibers. And what you're seeing there is a staining against a, a structural protein in the muscle cell that's only expressed in a, in a, in a differentiated cell. So you can see that we can even model this, this, uh, this regeneration in the dish. Here's another picture, slightly prettier, using a different technology, but again, the, these cells here are muscle fibers that we are, we are making in a dish, essentially. So how are we doing here? Very well. I'm amazed that I could be in anywhere close to being on on, on the right time scale, but looks like I am. Um, so, I've told you about stem cells, told you about embryonic stem cells, where they come from. We've, talk, we've talked about the genetics of how you, uh, how, you, how you drive a cell down a particular cell lineage. So you guys know an incredible amount. Um, <laughs> now, the last bit that I want to talk about is um, something that we haven't really touched on very much, but it's incredibly exciting, and I'll tell you why. Because if, if you think about it, when cells differentiate, they, they do so sort of terminally, meaning you can't go back to the, to the stem cell-like state once a cell has differentiated. And this is one of the problems that people have been... Um, addressing for many years in the stem cell field. H how, do you, you know, how do you reverse that state? And uh, so, you know, to cut a long story short, over uh, probably many millions of postdoc and graduate student hours, um, this group in, in Japan, uh, building on the work of, uh, of, of a fellow at, uh, at Cambridge, Sir John Gurdon, um, came up with this method that they call IPS. And you'll see it in the next few years in the, in the popular literature. It stands for, because I, I know it's an acronym, uh, it stands for Induction of Pluripotent Stem Cells, IPS. So what does it mean? Well, Yamanaka, who's the Japanese guy who, who, who published this, got the Nobel Prize this year with John Gurdon. Not bad. Um, <laughs> So what he did was this. He took some skin fibroblasts. So if you take some skin, uh, extract the cells called fibroblasts in the skin, they're already differentiated, so they're not stem cells, of course. But if you take those cells, so I'm going to ignore this. If you take those cells and introduce these four factors in them, they back up, they go backwards, and they become stem cells. Yeah, amazing. No one ever thought that this could be possible. So, the four factors are, and again, you know, I'm going to test you on this at the end, CMYK, SOX2, OCT4, and KLF4. So, um, really, we don't need to remember the names. But what we do know is that these are, these are molecules involved in, in the same kind of, of uh, genome control that I told you about earlier on. They're transcription factors and RNA binding proteins. So four of them, if you introduce them into adult fibroblasts, will convert those cells back to stem cells. 
which is pretty powerful because now you can, you can probably already think of um, some therapeutic uses for those cells. So for example, if um, we already know a lot about programming heart cells from our work and many other groups. So what if I could take some of my own fibroblasts from my skin, back them up to be stem cells again with these, they call them Yamanaka factors from Shuji Yamanaka, the guy who discovered them. So you back them up to stem cells and then you reprogram them down the lineage that you want. So that's exactly what they did in some follow-up papers. So they found that uh, these iPS cells, depending on the conditions, they could turn into neural cells, they could turn into dopaminergic neurons, which are the, the neurons that are lost in the substantia nigra in Parkinson's patients. Um, they could convert them into motor neurons, can convert them into cardiac muscle, blood progenitor cells. And in, in fact, other groups since have, have even been able to, to produce a wider um, array of different cell types from these iPS cells. So clearly, you know, they have tremendous regenerative potential. But of course, like anything else in science, there, there, are always, there are always challenges, and there are still major challenges in this area that we uh, and, and many other groups have to face if, there, if we're ever going to, to harness that regenerative potential. But I think you can see already that, that some major breakthroughs have occurred in the last few years, and I would imagine that the next decade of regenerative medicine is going to be quite phenomenal. So, you know, I'm really excited about that. Okay, so where are we at here? Yes, so this is wonderful. Um, so here we are. You're all still awake. I can't see anyone who's asleep, apart, <laughs> apart from Professor Hutchinson. Um, <laughs> my, my comrade. Um, okay, so... So of course science, you know, we... we yeah, I'm just a spokesman for all this. I've been at York since 1993. I've had, you know, tremendous groups of people, graduate students, uh, technicians, postdoctoral fellows working on these problems. And uh, here's, here's but a few of them here, um, just shown here, one of our retreats at Eaton Hall. And, uh, and this is one of our days out on Toronto Island where we all kick a soccer ball around. Um, so, so anyway, I, I've had a very, very good and extensive group at, uh, at York. I'm supported right now by this uh, McLaughlin Endowment uh, in the form of a research chair, which is very generous. Um, we're also supported by several funding bodies. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, um, and NSERC, which is the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. So, so all of this you know, requires not insignificant amounts of, of resources. So you know, if you're ever in a position to advocate for science and science funding, please do so. <laughs> that keeps us off the street. Um, <laughs> and, and lastly, of course, Apart from our own group at, at York, every project that we do, that we do you know, typically involves collaborators from a variety of places around the world in our field, and these are just a few of our, our recent collaborators. So um, on that note, I really genuinely thank you for your, for your interest, and I'll happily, we've got time, so we can, we can entertain some questions and uh, see where we go from here. Um, oh, I do want to point out one thing. Those of you who are at Janusz Kaczynski's, the, the, the Dean of Engineering lecture this morning, he talked about going up into space and, and spending $3 million to, to, to be in this anti-gravity situation where everyone throws up. Um, <laughs> and, and, and actually, being biologists, we do it on a much lower scale, so this, <laughs> this is what we do. 
So we go out sailing on Lake Ontario occasion, and you can guarantee that several people will end up throwing up. So there you go. Anyway, um, 